So let's talk about some of the biggest and most important changes in the Tyranid Codex, looking at Termagant Special Weapons, rules for new detachments including the Assimilation Swarm and the Synaptic Nexus, and just what exactly is going to be going on with the rules to the datasheets, points, costs and altered unit profiles in Codex Tyranids. Hello and welcome back to Warspex Tactics, where today we're talking through the swarms once more, and in this video I thought I'd just do a quick roundup of some of the biggest and most interesting changes in the new Tyranid Codex, perhaps some of the biggest rules that are most going to affect people's armies, and are most interesting when I was reading through the book. As always with a new Codex there's really quite a lot to unpack here, I thought for this video I'd just do an overview of some of the things that interested me the most, and then follow us up later in the day with a full Codex review, talking through every single detachment and unit in full. I might also just stop off along the way to do a proper video on the Norn Emissary and Assimilator, I feel like they're some of the more interesting ones as well, so I'll probably cover them next time. Loads of good stuff here though, so let's talk about new detachments, new special weapons, and the changes to datasheets and points and things, with a look at six of the biggest highlights from the new book. First up, I thought the detachments that I was most interested to find out more about are the Assimilation Swarm and the Synaptic Nexus, up to now we've not really had all that many details about them. Starting with the Assimilation Swarm though, Games Workshop have basically just teased that it could be something that's quite good for Haraspexes, and it does seem that they're right with that. I feel like this one is maybe one of the biggest curveballs of the Tyranid Codex, it's a detachment that's themed around Harvester units like the Haraspex, Psychophage, Rippers and Pyrovorce, a new keyword that's been added to all of these datasheets, and basically only really functions to make this detachment work if you try and build around them. I guess the idea is that this is a swarm that's got into the process of devouring the planet and processing it for the Tyranids to assimilate it and take it onwards to new conquests, and seem to be pretty happy to keep doing so as they're fighting with the enemy. For the assimilation swarm you get your usual complement of stratagems and enhancements, but perhaps their biggest and showiest of the rules is their feed the swarm rule, where basically if you can have these harvester units on your midfield objectives, it gets to heal a nearby Tyranid unit within 6 inches in the command phase. I guess the idea would be that in your command phase, if you had a Haraspect on a midfield objective, it would be able to regenerate itself or choose to regenerate a model nearby. If you had multiple Harvester units on that same controlled objective, you'd be able to heal multiple different Tyranid organisms as well, though you wouldn't be able to stack all of that healing on the same one. Each Tyranid model can only be regenerated once per turn. To make the healing boost applicable to lots of different units in the army, there's two different options that you can use to heal the bugs. If it's perhaps something like a one model unit, you could choose the heal D3 wounds one. So say if you had your Haraspex there, it could potentially just heal D3 wounds for being on an objective in the command phase, all nice and helpful. Though if you've got infantry units, then you could either potentially just have one infantry model come back at four wounds remaining, kind of powerful if you could use that on a big hefty infantry model, maybe something like a Tyrant Guard, though they have still tried to make it applicable to the swarms and things, as if you select an Endless Multitudes unit for that, then you can restore three models to the swarm instead of just one. I feel like the rule's interesting enough, and it means that you want to go for objectives with harvesters, ideally get these feeder beasts stuck into the midfield, and then your opponent either has to try and kill them, or you're going to be healing a bunch of units nearby. While I think it's interesting and good to have a whole load of healing splashed around, I feel like it might not be quite as strong as the Invasion Fleet's core buff. That remains the choice of the different adaptive traits. I feel like the healing is maybe just a little bit on the scattergun side, and it means that your opponent would have to fail to kill you off midfield objectives. Plus you'd have to have units that are both injured but not destroyed as well. Sometimes that happens, but your opponent might be able to go for complete kills. I still think it looks like a fun and thematic rule though, and of course it does have a fair bit of support with stratagems and things that I'll talk about in the main Codex review. One enhancement that I did quite like though was Instinctive Defence for 15 points. It allows your units to fight first when you're within 6 inches of a Harvester unit, or get free Heroic Intervention within 6 inches of a Harvester unit as well. Between those two that does seem quite nice for a big scary Tyranid melee unit. Fights first in particular is very nice to have if there's melee troops coming at you. Next up, another thing I was very curious about was the profiles of the new Termagant Special Weapons. Perhaps one of the slightly more surprising choices was the option of three different Special Weapons in the new Termagant kit that they're coming out. You get a Spike Rifle, Shard Launcher and Strangle Web. For the most part, the Tyranid Termagant datasheet isn't really all that changed. He still gets 10-20 to 20 models in the squad, and they're either 60 points for 10 or 120 for 20 of them. Their Battle Line and Endless Multitude, so you can have loads of them. And I've got their trusty stat line with Toughness 3, a 5 plus save, and Objective Control 2. 
Their main small arm weapons haven't really changed too much. You still get the Flesh Borer, Spine Fist or Devourer. I think I'd probably be more tempted by either the Spine Fist or Devourer myself at the moment. Getting Twin Linked on the Spine Fist is particularly nice. And then as with 10th edition points cost all being free, you basically just get these special weapons included now, and you get to have one of each of them within a squad completely no extra cost. The Shard Launcher is a small upgrade on your standard weapon. D3 attacks at 18 inch range with Blast and Heavy, hitting on a 4+, plus, Strength 5, AP 0 and Damage 1, so it kind of feels like a small version of the bio cannon that the Barb Gaunts carry around. You only do get D3 shots though. The Spike Rifle seems to be the least exciting, a single shot at strength 4, AP 1 and damage 1, though at least it's out to 24 inch range and has the heavy keyword. I feel like that's one that you could easily leave at home just compared with your regular weapon, it seems kind of similar to me. I think you're unlikely to really want to stand still all that much. Finally there's the strangle web launcher, that one's 18 inches with assault, devastating wounds and torrent, and it's basically a d6 shot flamer with strength 2, AP 0 and damage 1. Typically you are going to be trying to get those 6s I suppose for the devastating wounds. Out of those 3 though, I feel like the shard launch and the strangle web are both pretty interesting. They definitely make the squad a little bit more dangerous at 18 inch range. And I guess that's a small upgrade compared with Termigants previously, having a little bit more bite in the swarms. I don't think it's really going to change the world in terms of making them into a top class damage dealing unit or anything like that. But I guess if you absolutely want to optimise your list, it might well be worth having some around with the shard launcher and the strangle webs. I feel like a lot of people might well be converting these from existing termagants. I guess maybe you could use some barb gaunts to stand in for shard launchers if you like, I suppose. Besides the termagants though, another thing that I was very interested to find out was just how much most of the data sheets have changed. Due to this being one of the first codexes of 10th edition, Games Workshop haven't really had a chance to both release the index rules and then make any sort of adjustments based on playtesting or anything. I'd guess that the majority of the Tyranids Codex rules were kind of finalised before 10th edition went live, so perhaps as expected changes are minimal, but they aren't entirely absent, there's around about 10 datasheets that have had various alterations, and new points cost as well as we'll get on to. Otherwise, as we saw with the new Elixir the other day, the presentation style of the datasheets has changed a fair bit, the entirety of the unit's rules is all consolidated onto just one side of a data card now, as opposed to on multiple different sides. So it does depend on whether you're looking at them from the pack of data cards or from the codex set. The new Elixir datasheet on the top right here, that's from the codex. You get the flavour text and the unit options on the same side as all the profiles. Whereas that one from the Hive Tyrant, that's on the bottom right there. That's one of the ones from the new Tyranids data card set. And you still have the army construction side and in-game side split across different sides of the card. Otherwise though, generally the rule is that things have stayed the same unless you've heard otherwise. And I'll cycle back to talk about a few of the most major changes of data cards in just a second. Before that though, let's take a look at the Synaptic Nexus, the other formation that I was kind of interested to find out more about. This one feels like it could have been a contender for one of the more generic Tyranid style detachments. It's centred around Synapse Tyranids, giving orders to their minions. And this one seems very similar in style and flavour to perhaps the 9th edition Tyranid Codex. It's the return of the Synaptic Imperatives, so buffs to the units nearby the Synapse Monsters. These Synaptic Imperatives sort of work a little bit similarly to things like Space Marine Combat Doctrines. There's three different buffs that you can flex into over the course of the game, and you can access each of them once. These buffs then go on to apply to all Tyranids within Synapse range, so both the monsters themselves and also the ones nearby. And there is a one command point stratagem to allow you to flex into any one of them with one Tyranid unit. So you could say pick up a 5 plus invulnerable save for 1 CP if you wanted to. The three choices that you get are a 5 plus invulnerable save, a plus 1 to advance and charge, and a plus 1 to hit in melee. Between the bunch of these it does make the formation kind of feel like it's a bit more favoured towards melee than shooting Tyranids, perhaps slightly surprisingly maybe. The invulnerable save is just going to be generally useful, particularly with Tyranids without the highest saves in the world. Perhaps a little bit more use on things like swarms as opposed to monsters I guess. But then the advance and charge buffs and the plus one to hit in combat seem very combat orientated. Probably means that you're incentivized to go a little bit heavier towards the combat bogs than the shooting bogs than you might have done otherwise. Otherwise as with the rest of them it's backed up by a bunch of cool stratagems and enhancements. I'll go through the full table when I do the full codex review tonight. Perhaps a couple of the ones that jumped out to me the most though was a 1 CP for Irresistible Will. That's one way you can basically mark an enemy target within 24 inches of a synapse unit, and then friendly Tyranids within 6 inches get to reroll hits and wounds of 1 against that target this phase. That could genuinely be really quite a good buff to a ranged Tyranid gunline or something, 
You could have a whole clutch of Maliceptors with some big rerolls on the go, or the same for Exocrines, I guess. Quite nice if there's just one tanky enemy unit that you need some maximal efficiency against. Another perhaps smaller one that I quite liked from this one as well was called Power of the Hive Mind for 10 points. That one's a Psyker only, and it gives you plus 1 strength and plus 1 AP to Psychic weapons used by the model. I feel like that one seems basically an auto-include upgrade if you're running a Neuro Tyrant. Its Psychic Flame attack is already at least fairly savage and not too bad for the cheap 105 points that it costs. With extra strength and extra AP on the go, it's going to be a pretty brutal Overwatch threat. Getting back to units and data sheets again, I thought it was interesting that points costs are indeed in the codex and they have changed a bit compared with the index. Not every unit has been altered, but around about half the codex has just wiggled slightly up or down, a few of them significantly, though most by relatively small amounts. In 10th edition, it looks like Games Workshop is doing something a little bit more pragmatically and proactively to the previous ones. As well as the points section, they've also got a QR code in the book linking you to the download section of the Warhammer community webpage where you can find all the latest documents for Warhammer 40k. I guess this is just to show that in future balance updates, they're probably going to change things around in the Munitorum field manual, make certain units better or worse depending on strength. So I guess that's one way of future proofing the codex. The inclusion of that section though does make me a little bit sceptical as to whether or not the current points cost in the Tyranid Codex are the ones that are intended to be used right now. Hopefully Games Workshop doesn't delay too much in releasing a new updated version of the Munitorum Field Manual, and that way we won't have two sets of Tyranid points cost in the game, fingers crossed they can all line up, and then I guess it will be the Field Manual that would take precedence from then on. My suspicion is that it'll probably be most of the ones in the new book that will stay. There's maybe just a couple of ones that are a bit dubious about, like the Biovore update. That one seems to be back down to 45 points. I kind of wonder how much that's intended, given that it went up in the very recent indirect fire nerf. So it's maybe a little bit unclear as to whether or not it's intended to be 45 or 65 at the moment. Biovores did get toned down a little bit, as we'll get on to in just a second. Just for some tasters of the points costs, and again I'll go through all of them in full once we get to the full codex review. Barb Gaunts have gone up slightly at 55 points or 110, basically 1 point per model extra, but I still think they're very good for the points. The Tyran effects has dropped down to 190, though its special rule has been nerfed a bit, it no longer is minus 1 damage, but instead it just makes 1 attack damage 0 once per game, which I think is generally going to be less useful overall. The extra currency is a surprise buff going down to 125 from 135. These were already very good at 135. I feel like they're getting even more auto include if they change that there. The Winged Prime was perhaps one of the more underwhelming units in the index, but it's dropped by really quite a large amount, dropping all the way down from 80 points down to 65. Kind of nice to have a fun new model like that actually look quite good now. I feel like you could very easily include him in a unit of gargoyles just to make them as a bit more of a skirmishing melee threat as opposed to just ranged chaff. Finally, the Brood Lord's down to 90 points from 100, but Gene Sealers have increased by 1 point per model, so there's perhaps a little bit more skew in including a Brood Lord in the unit compared with just Gene Stealers on their own. Finally, here are a few of the more interesting changes to several Tyranid units, both positives and negatives. Rippers look kind of amazing to start out, at just one model for 15 points to a maximum squad size of 3, means that you can now field them direct from a box of Termagants or Hormagants, and just having a few of these just to disruptively deep strike and screen out the enemy or do secondary objectives seems basically auto include. Looks like Rippers have jumped from being a little bit underwhelming to thoroughly amazing again. Biovores and Pyrovores have both got stat line increases, better defence with getting an extra wound each, and the Biovore gets a 3 plus save as well. The Pyrovore looks very tanky for the cost now at just 30 points still, as its points cost haven't changed, and the Biovore looks a lot more annoying for the enemy to kill even if they can see it, particularly at a 45 point cost. The Biovores have had their spore mines reined in a little bit, now it's one of those rules where only one of them can spawn a spore mine per turn now. That basically means that it's super efficient just to have one in the army, but the extra ones might be a little bit more take or leave, I think. Barring any big rules updates with the balance changes, it doesn't look like there's anything that stops spore mine scoring objectives still. Gene Stealer's got nerfed a bit, as their damage buff has been changed to reroll ones to hit innately, and then reroll ones to wound in melee, rather than getting the full wound rerolls that they had in combat, which was rather nice. This now means that they can't just go fishing for devastating wounds if they've got a brood lord in tow, which I think does turn them down really quite significantly. Not the nicest change to them, but particularly now they've gone up in points per model as well. Neurogaunts can't gain synapse from other Neurogaunts, which is a very, very tiny change there. Lictors, on the other hand, have had a slightly rough time of it, losing their 5 plus invulnerable saves. 
Looks like it's just the Death Leaper and the Neuro Elixir that get the invulnerable saves as well, and they're all the way up to a big 4 plus. I feel like this probably cements Death Leaper as fairly solidly ahead of the regular Elixir now. And Neuro Elixirs are looking a lot more interesting as particularly tanky and cheap lone operatives. They're only around about 60 points, I believe. Finally, the Psychophage has taken a nerf, going down to anti psycho 4 plus rather than 2 plus, so it's no longer handing out anywhere near as regular devastating wounds to psychic models. Kind of a shame, really. I don't think that he was particularly overpowered, though I guess he could be really quite swingy and a lot better against Grey Knights or Thousand Suns armies, I suppose. And the Spore Assist has gone down in points a bit, down to 1, 2, 5, but it just seems kind of thoroughly terrible now. It just only fires Overwatch for free instead of shooting four different units when they move in front of it. So it's lost an enormous amount of damage output and reason to take it, even if it has gone down in cost. Overall, lots of interesting stuff there. From first takes, I feel like that Synaptic Nexus formation is kind of interesting. Currently, Rippers and one Lone Biovore look pretty well auto-included in an army, both for secondaries and just generally being annoying and disruptive. I feel like the Exocrine is even more standout now, and the Winged Prime is a lot more playable at 65 points compared with 80. In any case, let me know your thoughts on the changes or any other big interesting reveals that you've seen so far, and I'll look forward to following this up with some more videos. I'll aim to make a review of the Norn Emissary next, and then go on to the full Tyranid Codex later today. If you've enjoyed the video, then feel free to subscribe to Allspets Tactics, where I'll certainly keep the regular 40k videos coming, I do tend to post new ones just about every day. Finally, if you have been enjoying all the videos on the channel, I would just like to mention that Allspets Tactics does have a Patreon page as well, and you can find that linked in the video description if you'd like to help support. Channel patrons do get a fair few advantages, seeing certain videos early, regular votes to see what sort of things happen next on the channel, and automatic entry into the regular prize giveaways with a chance to win some big model kits each month. If any of that sounds good to you or you'd just like to help support, the link is down in the video description. In any case, a massive thank you for listening, and I'll hope to see you guys next time.